morning. It is 7 o'clock and you are watching Ireland AM. You are. Good morning. We hope you're doing well. We're waking you up with a GAA grace, a flatbread feast and a dynamic DJ. I mean, come on, Tuesday That's morning. an exciting three hours to come. Coming up shortly, or well, no, later on, we're going to be talking <laughs> to the comedian with over what time is it? a million followers, Rory Stories, and the two-time all-star, Philly McMahon, about heading to Mountjoy. And he's racked up billions of streams with hits like Hand on Heart, was that one of the ones in Love Island, and Sorry. DJ Joel Curry, who of course used to be in Geordie Shore, he will be checking in for a chat You'll a little bit later on. definitely know a couple of his tunes. He's got some You have to make sure bangers, that I don't try to do a Newcastle accent. Newcastle. Newcastle! Uh, plus, we are going to examine the impact health warning labels on alcohol products will have on the drinks industry. We're going to have the Minister of State for Public Health here, Hildegard Norton. We want to hear from you on yeah. this. 0896 111 Do you think that we need to have health warnings like what we see on cigarette packets? on our bottles of wine, our beer, let us yeah. know. A lot of arguments that it'll stop public order offences. Do you think if you see that something causes cancer, it'll make you not... But anyway, listen, there's lots to discuss in just a while we really want to hear from you. Alan is outside this morning uh, yeah. with the Vroom Vroom. How are uh, you? Oh. I am indeed, yes. Listen, this is the biggest electric car vehicle brand that you've probably never heard of. And Geraldine Herbert is here to talk about the arrival of the BYD to Ireland. Good morning, Geraldine. Good morning, Alan. This is the BYD Atto three and it is their uh, probably the, the newest electric car to the market and you think this is going to do really well here yeah it has all of the ingredients to be really successful well priced well specced and look at it it looks great it looks great indeed and for a good mid-range price as yeah. well so we're going to be chatting to and showing you more of it a little later on but derek is live in kildare this morning how's the weather looking derek Yes, good morning, Al. We're live here in Lollymore in County Kildare this morning. In fact, we're very close to the Offaly border. It's another dry and settled start. It's a good bright spell out there today with that lovely ridge of high pressure. But guys, we've come down here to Lollymore Heritage and Discovery Park. Take a look at this beautiful train. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning, there, guys. Yeah, good morning to you. Guys, we're going to be taking you on a tour, guess what, of the Bog of Allen. Good morning, guys. <laughs> right across the morning, we've got our own little train here as well. Off we go. <laughs> Off we go there, Johnny. Fire her up. We'll see you later, lads. <laughs> Johnny, it's far too early for that. I was to say, if you weren't awake, <laughs> you are now. You're delighted with us, We'd I'm sure. We'd love to live in Lullymore. Nice it's, place. It's yeah. a nice word to say, Lullymore. We've got loads coming up, as you can see, and so much more besides. But right now, let's go over to the Virgin Media News Hub for the first time today and say good morning to Geraldine Lina. Thanks, Maureen. Good morning. Police will today begin searching a reservoir in Portugal for missing toddler Madeleine McCann. German police requested the search when it became known that the area was visited by the chief suspect in the child's disappearance around the time she vanished. Christ Christian Bruckner was made a formal suspect in the case by Portuguese prosecutors in 2022. Three-year-old Madeleine disappeared while on holiday with, with her family in the resort of Praia de Luz in the Algarve in 2007. A large stretch of the reservoir has been sealed off and roads leading to it have been closed off while the search gets underway. Europe's highest court will today begin hearing an appeal of a ruling overturning a finding that Apple owes the Irish state over 13 billion euro in back taxes. The case centres on a ruling by the European Commission back in 2016, which was subsequently rejected by the EU's lower court in 2020. Concerns over Apple's tax strategies were first raised in 2013, when its boss Tim Cook faced a US Senate committee. The tech company was accused of sheltering billions of dollars in profits through a tax arrangement with Ireland and through its use of ghost companies with no jurisdiction, in particular Apple Sales International. This caught the eye of the European Commission. Then in 2016, a bombshell finding. The Commission ordered Apple to pay back taxes totalling 13.1 billion euro to Ireland. Two tax rulings uh, granted by Ireland have artificially reduce Apple's tax burden for over two decades. Both Apple and Ireland rejected the findings, disputing there had ever been a special deal. They both launched separate appeals, and in 2020, an EU court overruled the decision. Now the European Commission itself is bringing an appeal to the Court of Justice of the European Union, claiming the lower court had made a number of errors. The case could take another year to conclude. Aubrey Robinson, Virgin Media News. 
U.S. President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy have met to discuss the U.S. debt ceiling, with both sides calling the discussions productive. No deal has yet been reached, but last night President Biden said the prospect of a default is now off the table. The Treasury Secretary had previously warned that the U.S. could default on its debt as soon as the 1st of June if no progress was made. President Biden and Kevin McCarthy met, met in the Oval Office last night in an effort to break the deadlock. We still have some disagreements, but I think we may be able to get where we have to go. We both know we have a significant responsibility. But I think we both agree that we need to change the trajectory, uh, that our debt is too large. And I think at the end of the day, we could find common ground. Firefighters in Italy's northeastern region have been continuing clear-up work and removing flood water amid fears of further landslides. Authorities are working to restore electricity to thousands of households, clean up roads and streets and fix bri bri bridges damaged by recent flooding. The adverse weather has killed at least 14 people in the region and caused the evacuation of more than 10,000 residents. Flooding has also destroyed many crops in a crucial rural area for Italy. Saudi Arabia's first female astronaut has arrived at the International Space Station. Rihanna Barnawi, a stem cell researcher, was one of four paying passengers on a SpaceX flight that docked with the space station yesterday afternoon. She's joined by another Saudi astronaut, a Tennessee businessman and a retired NASA astronaut who now works for the company that organised the trip. The group will spend the next week carrying out science experiments before returning to Earth. It's the second chartered flight to run to space run by SpaceX. Firefighters in Alberta, Canada are making progress tackling dozens of wildfires thanks to some much needed rain. But of the 81 fires still burning, 23 are still considered out of control. Around 10,000 people have had to be evacuated and more than 2.3 million acres of land has been burnt. Authorities say this wildfire season has been the most active on record. And finally for now, in the US, an 11-foot alligator made its way into a city neighbourhood in Missouri before being removed with the help of a wrecker truck. He was spotted by a man driving home in the middle of the night. It took three hours for a professional trapper to catch the huge animal. It's estimated he weighed about 1,100 pounds and was about 85 years old. The gator was taken to a rescue park to live out his older years. We compare 14 insurance quotes to get you the best deal. So choose chill and work smarter, not harder. Thank you, Jaron. A very good morning. We're coming to you live here from Lollymore in County Kildare. This morning, we're off to take you on a trip around the Heritage and Discovery Park here this morning, as well as a trip to the beautiful Bog of Allen. A lot of conservation work, a lot of rewilding going on there. So that's all to come uh, right across the morning. Anyway, let's take a look at weather together now with Avril Valera with us on cameras this 23rd of the month. And you'll be glad to hear it's a lovely settled start out there this morning. A couple of hit and miss light showers through northern Corinth into Park parts of South Donegal at the moment but elsewhere it is wholly nice and dry with some sunshine beginning to push through that cloud now as the morning goes on those light northwesterly or variable breezes. Now right across today in fact a pretty settled one out there today that ridge of high pressure keeping conditions uh, dry for the most part again some nice bright spells a little bit cloudier once again through parts of the northwest where once again we're going to see some light rain and drizzle play its part. Top temps in and around 15 to 18 even 19 in some spots. Spots. And finally then tonight, very similar to what we saw last night, it's going to be mainly dry, calm and settle, a little bit of mist and uh, that'll take us through into tomorrow morning with more sunshine on the cars, working our way into your Wednesday with values back to around 6 to 11 degrees. So that's how it's shaping up here in a dry and settled Lollymore in County Kildare. We'll be back again live at 7.35. Chill insurance work harder so you can work smarter. We compare 14 quotes to get you the best deal. It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. It's headline, Irish data watchdog disagreed with the 1.2 euro billion fine on Meta. A record fine against Facebook owner Meta for violating privacy law was imposed in the face of claims by Ireland's data regulator that no financial sanction was needed. Direct provision centres tripled despite promise to end system, despite the government committing to end direct provision, which has been consistently criticised by human rights groups. Figures show the system is getting bigger and relying more on inappropriate accommodation largely provided by hospitality sector. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. 
The examiner leads with CUH staff avoid PwC advisors. Key staff at Cork University Hospital have been told by their union not to cooperate with or even attend meetings with PricewaterhouseCoopers consultants hired to implement a transformation and improvement programme at the hospital. Two new migrant blockades spring up. Hundreds of international protection seekers were prevented from entering a new accommodation centre in Santry, North Dublin. Locals said they stopped a number of buses from entering Airways Industrial Estate. And that's the top story on the Daily Mail. The mirror goes with Maddy Cop's Search Lake. Officers will scour the site 30 miles from Praia de Luz, the Portuguese resort where the three-year-old went missing. The prime suspect in the case, German paedophile Christian Bruecker, described the remote reservoir as his little paradise. The Sun also leads with that same story, Maddy Riddle of the Lake. The reservoir was searched twice back in February and March in 2008, but a source has said it is a huge development. The star leads with nothing will bring back our beautiful Jasmine at the Central Criminal Court. Mr Justice Paul Burns yesterday passed sentence on Richard Burke, who was found not guilty of murdering Jasmine McGonagall, but guilty of her manslaughter earlier this year. The family of Jasmine McGonagall has vowed she will never be forgotten. And the Herald goes with security fears for teen attack suspects. The five boys arrested for their involvement in a shocking assault on a 14-year-old boy in Navan have been given detailed personal security advice by the Guardi after receiving abuse and threats online. Now, coming up after the break, broadcaster Anton Savage is taking a closer look at the major stories in this morning's papers. We'll be back with you very shortly. You're very welcome back to the show. Now join us to discuss what is making the top stories in the newspapers this morning is News Talk's broadcaster, Anton Savage. Good morning to you, <laughs> Anton. How are you? Great to have you with us. Let's start off with this first story. Big news, Meta have been fined $1.2 billion. Despite the Irish regulators claim that no financial sanctions should be needed. Keep your money, babes. Keep yeah, your this money. Is one of the, this is a bit like the uh, Apple fine, where we find ourselves in a position of having to say, no, please, we don't actually want your money. <laughs> there is a good reason why we don't want the money. So, um, the way uh, the data regulate... Why were they fined, first of all? They were fined for failing, effectively for failing to keep data in Ireland. Yes. So, the, if you are Meta, if you are Twitter, if you are LinkedIn, if you are anything, uh, any of those kind of social media giants, you get data from a Tommy or a Murren from their profile, and the rules say you can only process that data within the European Union. If your servers are based in Mountain View or Sacramento or wherever they are, and you transfer that data over there, that data is now subject to American regulation, okay. or as we call it, no regulation really whatsoever. So the European data regulation said, no, 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 keep it within the EU so we can make sure that GDPR and everything else is being yeah. done properly. The Data Protection Commissioner has come out and said, Meta hasn't been doing this correctly. The reason it's significant that Ireland does that is because all of the, or most of the EMEA headquarters for these big tech yeah. companies are in Ireland. So Helen Dixon, the Data Protection Commissioner, is fining effectively for Europe rather than for just yeah. Ireland. That means that she has to act in concert with all of the Data Protection Commission agencies across Europe. And mm. they, there is sort of almost like an appeals body that oversees what she does. In this instance, what Helen Dixon said was, look, I'm telling Meta that they have to go back through every single record, pick out every person whose data they moved to America, bring it back and then delete it. This is like Sisyphus pushing a stone up a hill. Is it, it though? It, it's it, well. I'm, I don't know. They <laughs> a few buttons, and it's like there we go. It's everyone. Yes, it's billions and billions of pieces of data. Yes. So what so she's saying is this is punishment enough. It'll drive them bananas. It'll cost fortune. Okay. The rest of Europe is saying don't care. Get some cash off. Make them do it, plus find them one point two billion. Find them 1 .2. I, I saw Facebook kicking up a bit of fuss, saying that they're not the only tech company that's doing this, and that they've been pulled up, but. What about all the other companies that are doing it? Correct. Now, the difficulty about this is it's like being Andre the Giant in a field of four-year-olds. You're kind of noticeable because you're <laughs> huge. So where are you going to start? You're going to start with the low-hanging giant fruit, which is Meta. But undoubtedly, Helen Dixon, Data Protection Mission, is looking at all of the uh, okay. rest of them. The difficulty for Meta will be the practicality of being able to do this. Yeah. They've given, I think, five months to unpick all this, and it's going to be a serious challenge. But it also shows the sheer quantity of money that uh, Meta makes because effectively the Irish Data Protection Commissioner's yep. view is you can take a billion euro away from them 
and they don't even notice. No. It wow. Means not nothing. even a But thing. that's on top of 319 million that they've already been fined this year for personalised ads. So, I mean, it's serious money coming into the coffers of Ireland as well. Well, it what is... happens with this money? I haven't a clue. I yeah. don't, I'm, I'm it's assuming Europe. because it's European that yeah. it gets distributed across, but maybe it's one of those... Where we I was reading it goes into know. the Irish coffers there, but it... who knows, yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a European penalty as well because it is Austria and then like they're the like, Apple this thing. is... I'm, Tommy exactly. Says Ireland, great, let's um, Also, they keep breaking laws, so there should be some sort of a penalty, uh, but of course... But the one nice thing in this is the fact of um, the data protection, not just in Ireland, Ireland, but across Europe, we kind of are, by comparison to across the water, doing a hell of a yeah, job we on are. this. And okay. it's a nebulous, difficult thing mm. to explain to people, and therefore people don't think it's important. But it really yeah. matters. It matters yeah. that somebody is looking out saying, no, you need to be protected from being used as an advertising tool. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole trying to hold them to some sort of account. Absolutely. Um, now, because they're definitely not an underdog, underdogs are kind of students at the moment. Uh, there's just been a study done, a case study, this is with Catherine Donnelly in The Independent this morning, about how much students are paying on rent. Yeah. And they're focusing on UCD. But my God, this is beyond... I don't know how parents are affording this. Yeah, they take UCD because it, it is the single largest university in an urban centre to which people are likely to travel. Yeah. From all over the country, people are going to go to UCD. They looked at the people who rent within UCD and they found that one third of those who rent pay an average of 750 quid a month <laughs> in rent. Now, there was a time when, like, it's not that long ago where if you were on a tracker mortgage, that kind of money put you in a two-bed terraced house within the city limits. Yeah. Now you're in a situation where you're probably in a single room or in digs of some kind and you're paying, what, eight grand a year, more, nine grand a year? And for most parents who have kids going to that sort of level, like, for kids nowadays, if you don't have a degree, don't have a master's, you're very unlikely to get any jobs at the minute. So the pressure... Right on a lot of parents to try and... Like, you're talking, like, American parents who have to save up for their yeah. kids' college funds. Yeah. And there's also the thing of the, the two-tier system because, theoretically, we have free fees, which notionally means, sure, everybody gets third-level education. But if you're a rich family, you reach in your pocket, you pay the nine grand, you probably pay for stipends to the child as well, you pay for food, yeah. and the kid is able to go to college. If you're a poor family, well, the education may be theoretically free, but where do you find 12, yeah. 15 yeah. grand for food and subsistence? And this isn't something that's new, and it is all around the country. We have seen kids who are sleeping in cars, who are travelling, like there's one uh, person in the Irish Times travelling, doing a six-hour round trip to yeah. Offaly on public Offaly. transport to UC every single day. Five days a week, yeah. Yeah, we're okay. going to be talking about this more and more because this isn't a new thing. No. It's been around for a long time. And Airbnb. it's mired in the intractable problem, that, or apparently intractable problem, that seems to be the homelessness crisis, yeah. the rental crisis, the housing crisis. So there is a lot that needs to be done to get it fixed. But 750 quid a month for a student. Yeah, is, and yeah. there is, there's a registration fee, I think a fee of up to three grand, I think, on top yeah. of that. We're so. kind of all waiting for, and I know that they're trying to do some regulation, but Europe have said to Dara O'Brien, your, your regulation, how you're meant to tackle Airbnb, is not robust enough. It's not going to work. And that's what parents are kind of looking for as well when Airbnb is tackled, more places will be lit up. We'd love to hear from you. I know that we're only in May and this is going to rumble on because, of course, we've got a whole new bunch uh -huh. of students who are going to be going in very very shortly. Uh, what's it like for you and your uh, college student in your house? 0896 111 yeah, And all over the country. Even, like, what are you paying in Galway, Cork? Oh, yeah. Like, we'd love to hear from you on that. Mine was 51.25 a week. I remember that in Galway. 15, 20, yeah, yeah over Poundland on Mainguard Street. God, it was amazing. It's well Loved worth it. it. I'd say the level of the digs back then weren't quite at the sort of level they No, my bed, nowadays. my bed was actually broken. Not because it was broken when I got it. It um, was broken when I got it. Yeah. <laughs> hey. No. Oh, of course I it was. It was broken yeah, when I got it. it. Let's, move on, let's move on to another you, story. That's what you told the landlord. That you're dying. <laughs> I swear. Why did I do it? Uh, let's get on to another story that you're dying to talk about. And that is... Dying to go. Sits Pinkler's. I want to talk about the Sitz Pinklers. Who sit are they? Sprinklers. Sitz Sitz Pinklers? Sitz, Sitz Sprinklers. Sitz, just a sitting whittler. <laughs> Indeed, that's there what it is. Uh, one is. of the lesser known Batman villains. Um, what this <laughs> is, is the Germans, who, as you know, like the Germans, and I mean this in the nicest way, they have some, there's some Quirky. quirkiness to them, like the leather trousers and the giant beers <laughs> and all the rest of it. There's some odd stuff. Well, it turns out that according to a poll, 66% of German men sit while urinating. The term for this in German is something like sit sprinkler. Because, you know, sprinkler. it's like um, flugplatz. They like to say things that mean... They have great they, words. They do, indeed. So sit sprinklers uh, are apparently the way we should all be doing it. Yes. yes. 
Wow. Well, <laughs> I've, I've seen. I've tapped into a rich yeah. We were actually on the same page. We were. Because you studies talk about, about little else in yeah. the morning. <laughs> oh, Tommy, I but wish I could. Sitting down this. urinating is better for men's health. Yeah, yeah, I don't believe it, but so they say. And the rest of your. Think about it. I don't like, want to. Like, as you're sitting it... and what happens to your system, like, it's how. It, it's how for number twos you should have your legs elevated. Yeah. What? That's yeah. what they say, yeah. You should have your legs elevated. Oh, dear God. How did uh, I end up in this conversation? Anyway, morning. going back to the stats underpinning this, the rest of Europe, uh, Spanish, French, you know, the, all the rest of us, only about 30% of men sit peeing down. Mm. Which, frankly, I don't believe at all. I do not believe that if yeah, I lined up 30. all of the men that I have ever known, that one out of three of them is secretly sitting down when they pee. Yeah. Don't yeah. believe it. Don't, Just don't believe it. No. Just for practicality purposes. It would take... Three times longer if you were sitting down all the so time. So inside a news talk, <coughs> Kieran Cuddihy. So we're taking shame, yeah. Kieran, yeah. pass Which, yourself. Who out of us? Sean is Moncrief. There? Who's the sitter? It's Moncrief. Well, listen. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, let us know on this. Here you go. Argentinian footballing megastar and World Cup winner Lionel Messi admits to sitting down while urinating. And he, he but think did about that those numbers. Like, if you go back cleaner. to the Irish team that you would have played on, five of them Listen, would have been sitting. You don't here. go into the toilets in there before <laughs> match. <laughs> I'm pretty. Oh. Uh, Anton Savage from News Talk. Thank you as ever. Oh eight nine six triple one triple one. Are you the one in three men who sit down to go to, to do your wee? Sean Moncrief, no. Anton will be in later on. You have a chat with him. That them was then. a compliment. We'll be back here. with you in just a minute on Ireland AM. Something that makes you wee. Oh, we'll be talking about alcohol. Yeah, we'll talk to you in just a minute. You're very welcome back. Now, Minister Stephen Donnelly has signed new regulation into law requiring all alcohol products to state their calorie content and health warnings on the label. Here to discuss the new regulations is Minister Hildegard Nocton with responsibility for public health, well-being and the national drugs strategy. And we're also joined by Tom Dorley, food and wine columnist with the Sunday Times Ireland. Thank you both for joining us. If we can just start with you first, Minister, thank you so much for the, uh, for coming in to see us. So. Alcohol products, this is coming in in 2026. They will have to state the calorie content and they're also going to have to state the number of grams of alcohol in the product. And are we going to have like cancer labels on them? Is it going to be like a, a, a cigarette packet? No, yeah. I suppose a bottle of wine will still look like a bottle of wine under a bottle of beers, but there'll be a small so a sticker on it outlining, as you say, the health implications of alcohol, uh, the number of calories on it. So what really this is about is just about informing the consumer. But are you going to try to bring in pictures or anything? Because, like, we all know that alcohol's... Most people know that it's got loads of calories in it. We know it's associated with lots of health risks. We do get that. Like, does it feel like it's nanny statism doing this if it's not going further? Yeah, I think we all do know. I knew that we all know alcohol is not good for you, but we enjoy it. I enjoy a glass of wine as well. But what this is doing is, I suppose, responding to the evidence that we've got. And we have, I suppose, a moral duty as well to tell people, inform people about the health risks. So, for example, the evidence that's coming through is that uh, almost 30% of cancers of the mouth are directly related to alcohol consumption. And also 7.5% of breast cancers, again, are related to alcohol. I knew alcohol was harmful, but when you see the stark st statistics there in relation to the direct correlation, this is just about not telling people not to drink, just knowing um, I suppose what it is you're consuming and just in relation to liver disease the amount of um, people who have alcoholic liver disease that has increased by a third over the last 10 years so all this is doing is informing people about the health risks and making them aware and it's up to people themselves what they do people will make up their own choice about how they how much they consume it's about excessive drinking uh, okay so so what's the aim of it then like to, do you think people are really going to le read those labels do you really think that it'll make a big difference I think I think people will make more informed decisions as a result of it. I don't know if you will read and go... There will be, possibly, there'll be a link there as well for people to go in onto a website to get further information. But we have a duty to inform people when we get this evidence, particularly here in Ireland, about what's happening. Ireland, we have the third highest rate of um, alcoholic fetal syndrome um, in the world. So it's about giving that information. That's it. We do know that um, rates of drinking in Ireland are coming down. In 2010, it was like 14.2 litres 
litres of pure alcohol per person. Now we're down to 10. So something is working, right? Things are, things are working. But if we get to this level of slapping on a health label on this, are we going to have to slap stuff on red meat? on tomatoes, on cheese, on everything that is a carcinogen? I think we're doing this already in relation to sugary drinks and food. The, the um, cigarettes are now plain packaging. Um, we've, th this is happening as well across Europe. The European Commission, they have but a... But we've gone on a solo run with this when Europe are actually trying to do something. They're, like, they are trying to come up with a plan for alcohol together for everyone in the EU to do this. And... You know, Stephen Donnelly's gone off on a solar run like this and he was determined to do this rather than going, hi, Europe, can we all do this together? Well, we already know the evidence. We have the facts here in Ireland, so why wait? And just in relation to other countries, France are doing um, something similar uh, and uh, Germany, uh, they have warnings. So actually, France and Lithuania already have warnings there for, I suppose, women who drink if, when they're pregnant. Germany and Spain have warnings there for underage drinking. All this is about, really, is just informing people, making them aware, giving them the information that we now have in relation to the direct impacts that al excessive alcohol consumption has on our health, which we kind of knew, but I have to say, I myself was surprised to see the direct correlation between the, the rates of cancer and excessive drinking. Uh, let's bring Tom in on this. Tom, this is obviously set to come in in 2026, but you yeah. are quite against this. What's your take on it? Well, I... I I would be more positive about uh, the new situation coming in in 2026 if I did feel that it was actually going to do any good. Because, as the minister says, you know, we, we do have a rather problematic relationship with alcohol in Ireland. Uh, the, the figures that she's quoted are very stark indeed. Um, I'm just wondering, on the one hand, if this kind of labelling which, uh, as has been said, is a solo run, is, is actually going to have any impact, I would have thought it would be much better to act collectively um, as the EU. Um, it's also important to say that, um, you know, some, something good is happening in the terms that overall consumption of alcohol has been dropping, and that's particularly amongst younger people, and I think that's to be welcomed. Um, having said that, my, my real concern is about consumer choice because small producers of wine in countries like France and Italy and Spain, and we should compare these to our own farmhouse cheesemakers, the, the artisan food producers that we have here, um, they will, um, under um, this new scheme, um, probably find it simply not worthwhile to export to Ireland, because Ireland is, is, in the whole scheme of things, a very small market. Um, and that has a knock-on effect on the small businesses that deal with those producers in the uh, European countries. Um, and it also impacts consumer choice. Now, I'll accept that the kind of wines we're talking about are um, of, of interest to you know, I, I suppose relatively few people. Yeah. The big brands, the, the Yellow Tails, the 19 Crimes and Jacobs Creek and so forth will have no problem yeah, in um, working uh, within the new scheme. Well, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, and it is those smaller businesses that will be hit from this and it will yeah. hit people's pockets here in Ireland because we're already seeing the prices of alcohol being huge. Yeah. We're seeing the price of anything coming into this country. Being very, pricing as well. And it's just going to impact the price even more. But when we see a solar run like this, and something Stephen Donnelly is, is obviously very keen to push forward, would we not be better off putting our money into counselling, into services that we see that people need, you know, people who need those, you know, in, in socially deprived areas, people with mental health difficulties who pick up the bottle and who are under that bit of pressure. So that work is happening as well. Um, but just in relation to, I suppose, Ireland I mean, leading the way, this, this, is, this is coming anyway. And, and just in relation to, I suppose, the industry and concerns around costs, there, there is always a cost for something that has a health implication, but we don't expect the cost of this, which will be a small sticker uh, that can be applied to bottles of wine or beer or whatever, that the industry guidelines are going to be 
produced on this. So this will be worked out. And that's why we have this three year lead in as well in relation to this. It has been done for other products as well and industry does respond uh, to it. So that's why we're giving, I suppose, industry time to, to do this. But all this is about is uh, giving people, the public, the information that is not out there to the level that it is Listen, at the moment. Education is so important. I completely agree with you. Every time that we do something on alcohol, I'm like, oh, oh my God. But it's the same every time we do something on food and we do something on obesity levels and how that's affecting our public health system. So when you we're now looking at a nighttime economy and we are going to increase opening hours in certain places and longer licenses. There are people who are kind of like, is this not mixed messaging? Go and we're doing this. And then you're going to let people drink for longer. And I heard an argument yesterday about, well, you know, our district courts are, are full of people who have alcohol related offences, like a label saying this is a carcinogen isn't going to stop people. And, Absolutely. and free up our district and, courts. And we're not saying that this sticker, the small sticker on a bottle of wine or beer is going to prevent that. It's only one part of a whole approach. We have our Healthy Ireland uh, campaign raising awareness on drugs, alcohol. We have rehab detox. We have a citizens' assembly happening at the moment around people who are taking drugs now and really finding out what's happening on the ground in relation to the reduction okay. of even alcohol So you're sure this is going to go to head in 2026 and we're not going to do an about turn and it's Europe is going really to get involved? This is just about providing information. It is no no more than that and people will make their own decisions if you want to you know stay out late. Is it mixed messaging from no, the government? Absolutely not it's only it's only it's like when you're buying a piece or buying a product you want to know what's in it and it's giving people the facts that's so, all this is and then people we're not telling people not to drink that's not what we're saying I enjoy a glass of wine um, more than anybody else but this is about the health direct health implications of excessive drinking so that's if it. we're talking about leadership on this and we're saying low levels of alcohol consumption can incur cancer risk should the government lead on this and potentially even close the doll bar Again, we're not going to, we're not saying any, we're not telling people not to drink. We're not telling anyone not to drink. It's about making informed decisions. And we all have our own personal responsibility. I do, you all do. Now that we have the facts, we're equipped with it. We're not saying for people not to have fun, go out, enjoy them and enjoy themselves. That's not what this is about. It's about putting information on our on alcohol, telling us what is in it, calories and the grams of alcohol, and how it, it, there is a direct correlation to um, particular illnesses, yep. particularly cancer. Well, we'd love to hear from you as always. 0896 triple one triple one to get involved in this. Tom Dorley, who's food and wine columnist with the Sunday Times Ireland, who gave Tommy two stars in the restaurant Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us, and also um, Minister Hildegard Nocton, Minister of State with Responsibility for Public Health, Wellbeing, and the National Drugs Strategy. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back with you in Ireland AM very shortly. Thank you, sir. Now, Chinese brand BYD has already sold more than 3.5 million EVs and plug-in hybrids, and it's the world's biggest seller of what's to referred as new energy vehicles. And here to tell us more about that, uh, this beautiful car that's here is motoring editor from The Independent, Geraldine Herbert. Good morning to you, Good Geraldine. Good morning, Alan. And you're saying this is going to do really well in Ireland. Why? OK, I think this, there's a niche here for this, definitely. It's a family-sized car, as you can see. It's very well-priced. It's priced at just over 37,000. Mm -hmm. Has a range of 420 kilometres. Very well-spec. And I think if you look at the sort of rivals, the Hyundai Kona, the Kia Nero, it's priced in between them. So it's not cheap and cheerful Chinese. This is a good, well-built car. And why are we only hearing about BYD now? BYD have been hugely successful in Asia more than anything. They've slowly moved into the European market in the last year or two, but where they have moved in, they've been really successful. So this is the first car that's coming to Ireland. There is um, a saloon car coming. There's other um, varieties of, um, of BYD models coming on route, but this is the one for the moment. And then if you are in Ireland, who's going to be selling these cars then? OK, so there's two distributors in Dublin at the moment, or two dealers in Dublin. There's one in Cork, but there's more coming. You can check out the website to see where the nearest one to you is. So that's byd.ie. Now, I was, I was very impressed by we were looking inside it. Uh, earlier on. So tell us some of the features then and why it's, why it's so different. Yeah, there's some really quirky um, things inside it. As you can see, there's a lovely huge touch screen and there's, as I said, these little details. There's guitar strings on the door. Yeah, there's... I'm looking like it, it It all looks very funky and modern. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. That's exactly the word. It is funky. It's a bit different. You know, and they haven't gone to reinvent the wheel. Everything is where you expect it to be, but it's just that bit different. 
And, and, and you're saying a good price. Yeah, good price, as I said. And the really big seller is the range as well for that price. 420 kilometres is more than adequate for everybody. Now, can we talk about electric cars? And then, like, so we were talking, the grants are going down, aren't they? So they're being cut. So, I mean, they're, we're, trying to, we're trying to encourage people to buy electric cars, but and then they're cutting, cutting grants. Yeah, so what's, this, what's going on there? Yeah, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a new report out from Dundee this morning that is saying, it's saying that the average price of a new electric car has gone up by 13%. Second-hand cars, nearly new ones, anywhere between one year and four-year-old, are gone up by 10%. So that's not good news for anyone trying to get into the market. The grant has been reduced from 5,000 to 3,500 in July, so that's a 1,500 cut. Where that will impact is these sort of price-ranged cars. Down at the bottom end, you know, the 30, 30-plus 30 to 40, putting an extra 1,500 on that is going to make a difference. Not so much at the top end, you know, the 55, the 56,000, those sort of cars. Because if but you're spending, here, if you have yeah, that kind of budget, you're, another 1,500 is huge. Yeah. No, it's still not good it's news. It's still not good news. But at the bottom end of the market, which is where we really need people to buy into those affordable cars, that's what's going to be impacted. So it does seem like an odd move. And why are the government saying they're doing it? OK, so the government are saying that EV prices are coming down and it's now time to scale back the grants. Plus, they're putting £100 million into the charging infrastructure, so they're claiming that the money that they need to spend is going into that. Now, that does need to be spent and nobody's disputing that, but I think it's a bit too early to be rolling back on the grant. So when you see that in so far in 2023, 11,000 vehicles... Mm. Right, uh, these type of cars have been already registered. Do we have the infrastructure? I know we talk about mm. this all the time, but when you go to petrol stations now and there's people queuing just to charge mm. their car and somebody's going to be there for 45 minutes, it's adding nearly two hours if you're doing it on the way back as well to your journey. Yeah, I suppose two things to consider there. First of all, the majority of charging is done at home. About 80% of all charging is done at home or in work. So that's where it is. It's only really when you make those long journeys that you hit problems. The, inv the infrastructure is getting better, but depends on your route. And there are pockets in the country that are still not great. We need an awful lot more fast chargers. We actually have a lot of charging points, but they're not the fast ones. And nobody has a couple of hours to spend charging. No. So we do. Now, the plan is to bring in these very high-speed chargers every 60 kilometres on the motorway. That would be a game changer because suddenly no matter where so you're going... So where you could pull in. Yeah, and you'll hi it'll be high-speed charging, you'll be fine. But they're not in yet. They are coming, but, you know... I think we're going to be talking about this, the same thing next year, but they are coming. They're it is going to run the <laughs> way, they're the way. But you're saying we are going to see an awful lot more of this make in this country. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting um, addition to the Irish car market. OK, that's brilliant. Geraldine Herbert from the motoring editor for The Independent. Thank you so much. You. Uh, lots more still to come after this quick break. We'll see you in a few minutes. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Times. It's headline, Irish data watchdog disagreed with 1.2 billion euro fine on Meta. A record fine against Facebook owner Meta for violating privacy law was imposed in the face of claims by Ireland's data regulator that no financial sanction was needed. Direct provision centres triple despite promise to end system. Despite the government committing to end direct provision, which has been consistently criticised by human rights groups, figures show the system is getting bigger and relying on more inappropriate accommodation largely provided by the hospitality sector. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner leads with CUH staff to avoid PwC advisors. Key staff at Cork University Hospital have been told by their union not to cooperate with or even attend meetings with Price Waterhouse Coopers consultants hired to implement a transformation and improvement programme at the hospital. Two new migrant blockades spring up. Hundreds of international protection seekers were prevented from entering a new accommodation centre in Santry, North Dublin. Locals said they stopped a number of buses from entering Airways Industrial Estate. And that is the top story on the Daily Mail. The mirror goes with Maddy Cop's search <coughs> lake. Officers will scour the site 30 miles from Praia de Luz, the Portuguese resort where the three-year-old went missing. The prime suspect in the case, German paedophile Christian Brunecker, described the remote reservoir as his little paradise. The Sun also leads with that same story, Maddy Riddle of the Lake. The reservoir was searched twice back in February and March 2008, but a source has said it is a huge development. 
The star leads with nothing will bring back our beautiful Jasmine. At the Central Criminal Court, Mr Justice Paul Burns yesterday passed sentence on Richard Burke, who was found not guilty of murdering Jasmine McGonagall in 2019, but guilty of her manslaughter earlier this year. The family of Jasmine McGonagall has vowed she will never be forgotten. And the Herald goes with security fears for teen attack suspects. The five boys arrested for their involvement in a shocking assault on a 14-year-old boy in Navin have been given detailed personal security advice by the Gardaí after receiving abuse and threats online. Right, let's get mm. through a few of some of the texts coming. Al, we are talking about maybe the college students, how much they have to pay. Yeah, it's uh, struggling to pay for your college. Uh, Two-thirds of students at UCD and now pay at least 750 a month in rent. And Brona says, I have two girls in college and accommodation alone costs us 1,600 per month. We are a middle-income family and don't qualify for the grants. So to say that this puts a huge strain on our daily life is an understatement. And with a third child about to start college, we're not sure what we're going to do. Having kids, it's so expensive. Like, yeah. creches, you're talking a grand a month up to yeah. as well. Like, it, when does it end? It's just that it's meant to be free. And, you, like, if you just think back, like, 10 years ago, you could afford to send your kids to college. Mm. Like, you could. You'd probably be spending 200, 300 quid yeah. on rent, and people were trying to make that work. But 750 an average price? That's well, I crazy. mean, saying we were paying 800 a month for our son when he went to college, which included transport and food, worked out over 10 grand a year. His course was five years, so it's cost us upwards of 50,000 euro, and that is not including the course deposits. That is just crazy. It's just it? scandalous. And there was another thing here that German men are the world's most... The German Prolific. men are most likely to sit down to have a pee. It's Can you pronounce it? Sitting whittlers is what the word means in German, and it's sits, sits sprinklers. Sit sprinklers. Sit sprinklers. Tell me, are, are you a sit sprinkler? Is it? Sprinkler. Sit Anyway, no, I'm not. Sit sprinkler. Well, it actually said in the study a sit third sprinkler. of men in the rest of Euro, uh, 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 the EU, actually admit to sitting down while having a wee. Well, I was like, really? I but don't know. You, you told us what you don't. Huh? Well, well <laughs> because um, <laughs> I just enjoy sitting on the toilet. <laughs> don't enjoy sitting on the toilet. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, They're a private David, conversation. That David, is so not fair. David <laughs> said... Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. In our ear, it's just like, rescue Tommy. Someone rescue Tommy. No, David, sorry, David. David. What did David say, Tommy? Sitting down is the way to go. I call it going for a number one and a half. <laughs> a number one and a half. I love and it. I was afraid a little half would come out. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to take a moment for someone who really likes Tommy, not after this conversation. Oh, yes. I think that that's it. In the papers today is Marion Hughes. She's turned 109 and uh, she's a nursing home in Chapel is it, in Dublin and she is all over the papers. 109, she looks absolutely fantastic. Oh, she does but indeed. But we want to say birthday, a Kate. huge hello right now to <clears throat> Nellie Purcell. And Nellie Purcell is watching. Nellie is oh, 105 is. tomorrow. Hiya, Nellie. Hi, Nellie. She loves the show. And she loves Tommy. Of course All she loves Tommy. All about Mr. Bo. Oh, but she's a bigger fan. And his spits. Of, jo of Johnny Sexton. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I can put her in touch with him. Uh, absolutely, Nelly, I'll do that. But happy birthday to you. 105 is happy birthday. Are you sorting out a happy birthday message? I will, I'll get on to Johnny, get it sorted. There, there we go. We go. It's it. done. And thank you so much for watching, Nelly. We hope that you have an absolutely lovely birthday. Uh, more messages, you can send them in to us. 0896 111 now after the break. And I'm you will find out about Alan sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> if we really need to know that. Do you know what? We're going to be talking about something much stranger than this in just a little while. Can you remember the term goo-boo said by Charles Hahi? We're going to be talking about that very shortly. Now, back in 1982, the biggest manhunt in Ireland's history took place to find double murderer Malcolm MacArthur. The fallout of these murders was a huge scandal, both here and internationally. And also, some justice wasn't gotten for some of the victims. Our next guest wrote all about it in his brand new book. Please welcome journalist and author Harry McGee. Harry, it is lovely to have you here. This is your new book, The Murder and the Taoiseach, which was originally a podcast called Goo Boo. Yeah. Which is uh, a phrase that we've kind of all all heard even if we weren't around when it was come up with. So can you tell us about Malcolm MacArthur and how he ended up murdering two 
people, Bridie Gargan and Donald Dunn in 1982. Yeah, the story is as complicated and twisted as the Harlan Coben plot. Yeah. And it might be a little bit complicated to try to describe it all uh, within the space of 10 minutes or so, or even within an hour. But essentially, he was an aristocrat. He came from a very well-to-do family in County Meath. Uh, they always had a lot of money. He had a governess. He was privately educated as a child. Uh, his dad died when he was in his mid-twenties and he inherited the farm from his dad, which he subsequently stole, or sorry, which he subsequently oh. sold mm -hmm. rather than sold. <laughs> and he went and um, got up the equivalent of about a million euro. So that allowed him to set himself up as a kind of a man about town, a flaneur, uh, uh, a guy who went to cafes and went to f uh, fashionable pubs and uh, hung around Trinity yeah. without ever having to work. And he had this, he looked like this kind of exotic uh, species. He kind of wore tweeds, wore a dicky bow, wore silk cravats, uh, but he never worked. So uh, that was fine. Um, he was slightly odd. He, he didn't talk very much. Mm. He only spoke to people when spoken to. Uh, he was kind of distant and he was aloof. Some people described him as a kind of an oddball, which was fine. And he never came to the attention of anybody. Yeah. And very few people knew him. But then, uh, 10 years after he received his inheritance, he ran out of cash. He was on his uppers. He had frittered away his uh, inheritance. By that stage, he and his uh, partner and their young child were living over in Tenerife. He became obsessed with having no money. He didn't want to work. So he decided that he was going to kind of reinvent himself. And uh, he'd read about the IRA carrying out armed robberies in post offices and in banks. And he decided that he'd become one of those. He had no life skills. He didn't have a clue about how to go about it. So he came back to Ireland and tried to set himself up as an armed robber. And the uh, results were catastrophic. Tell us about how things went because there was the murder of a, a young nurse mm -hmm. sunbathing in Phoenix Park. Uh, and also of a young farmer from County Offaly. So his modus operandi was he decided that he needed to get a car and he needed to get a gun and nothing would stop him in his quest to get them. So to get a car, he went to the Phoenix Park and looked for what he described as easy prey. And he found this young nurse, Bridie Gargan, gold-winning nurse uh, from County Meath, who just happened to be sunbathing on a beautiful day in the, in the Phoenix Park. He came upon her, tried to steal her, her car. I don't know why he didn't steal the car and just drove away, but he insisted that she went into the car as well. She panicked, and then he just assaulted her in the most brutal fashion and uh, bludgeoned her to within an inch of, of her life, and she died several days later. And then he made his escape. It was a very strange escape as well, because in his panic, he got caught at one of the uh, exits to the Phoenix Park, and this ambulance happened to come along. And one of those strange coincidences, it saw the St. James's Hospital sticker, Bridie Gargan worked in St. James's Hospital, and it gave him a blue light escort all the way to the hospital, making good his escape. Yeah. He got to the hospital, he did a U-turn, and then he just vanished into thin air. And then he materialised again two days later when he uh, responded to an ad in the paper for a shotgun for sale in County Offaly. He got a bus down to Offaly, uh, to Eden Derry, stayed the night there, met the young farmer who was selling the gun. The young farmer took him out to the bog to show him the gun, and Malcolm MacArthur turned and just yeah. shot him at point, but it was just awful, at point blank range. Even thinking about it now, it's 40 awful. years later, it's such a tragedy. A young man called Donald Don Dunn Don. stole his car, went into Dublin and again disappeared. So all of this is happening. At this stage, the guards are starting to connect the dots because as much as violence has increased in Ireland, but in 40 years ago, this was unprecedented. And next thing, to jump forward a bit in the story, because there is more to this, he's found in the flat, the apartment of the Attorney General Patrick yep. Connolly. Charles thought he's Attorney General, so how is that? That was a very clever segue, uh, Maureen. You used unprecedented, one of the <laughs> yeah. goo goo words uh, in, your, in your segue to that. Yes, it was goo goo, and it's grotesque, uh, unprecedented, bizarre, and unbelievable. I might have got the two U's wrong there, but that everyone was the, always does yeah, that, yeah. that. That was the essential kind of uh, goo goo element. So he, he through his wife, or through his, through his wife, uh, was a friend of the Attorney General's and had been for some years. So when he started getting uh, really broke in Dublin, he'd been staying in a guest house. He decided that he needed some place to stay. So he appeared at the doorway of Patrick Connolly, who was a family friend. But Patrick Connolly also happened to be the Attorney General, the top law officer in the land. And he stayed with him for 10 days. 
And during the course of it, they went to an All-Ireland hurling semi-final together, uh, where Patrick Connolly, who was a huge GAA fan, uh, went to the Ord Corley section, and Malcolm MacArthur went to the Hogan stand, travelling around in a state car driven by a Gore the driver. Patrick Connolly, of course, was completely oblivious to the fact that his house guest was the man wanted for these two uh, uh, murders. So the guards uh, eventually uh, figured out that this very exotic kind of creature. He's a little bit like a false widow spider, you know, very exotic, but also very, very dangerous and very unpredictable. And he would have killed again had the Gordi uh, not uh, caught him. But they, they focused in, they discovered that he had a connection with Patrick Connolly mm -hmm. and they began to stake out the uh, apartment that Patrick Connolly lived in in Pilot View. And they eventually caught him on the 13th of uh, August, which was a Friday night. And that created a huge sensation when the media found out that the man wanted for the two most notorious murders in the state for half a century uh, had been caught in the uh, apartment of the top law officer. Just all hell <laughs> broke loose. Yeah, and a lot of questions about that relationship as well. But then uh, Patrick then got in touch with the Taoiseach, Charlie Hoy, to ask, could he go on holidays? Yeah, he, he had booked a really uh, expensive holiday for himself. He was going to travel by Concord from London to New York and spent two weeks going around the state staying in top dollar hotels. He paid a huge amount of money for his holiday. He was determined to go on it. But obviously he Charlie Hawhey knew nothing about this at no, the time. No, he ran Charlie Hawhey. And Charlie Hawhey was staying on Inishvikalon, which was his holiday island mm. off the coast of Kerry. At the time, the phone connections were very poor. It was a very bad line. <laughs> uh, there might have been some drink taken on Charlie Hawhey's behalf. Patrick Connolly might not have told him everything about what had happened. Charlie Hawhey didn't uh, appreciate the import or gravity of what had happened. I don't think he really fully understood that the murderer was actually caught in Patrick Connolly's flat. Okay. So at the end of the conversation, he apparently said, bon voyage, and allowed the Attorney General to go on holidays, which he did. Yeah. But that was a calamitous decision because the media hounded Patrick Connolly all the way to New York. Uh, Charlie Hawhey was informed the next day about everything that happened. He realised the gravity of his mistake. He summoned Patrick Connolly back to Ireland. He arrived back exhausted and had to resign. And then there was a famous press conference in which that very famous phrase, gubu, yeah. or the, the adjectives that yeah. formed gubu, were actually yeah. said. And it almost brought that government to its knees. The government stumbled on for another two months. It yeah. was a real ramshackle government. And then it just collapsed in September, October of that year. It was just... It's extraordinary one from of beginning the, to end. One of the first many scandals that then plagued Charlie Hawhey for the rest of his career. But when, when we talk about this, um, he, Malcolm MacArthur, who is out now, and we see, I see him on the streets of Dublin all the time, and you've met him when you were preparing for this book. Uh, he was charged with one murder, and that was of Bridie Dargan, the nurse that yeah. he murdered brutally in Phoenix Park. But Donald Dunn was never charged with murder. And this has always left questions over why they didn't. They said it was about expense, and sure, we have him for one murder. Yeah, that, that, that has caused huge controversy yeah. and massive injustice to the Dunn family. Yeah. And they campaigned for years to have that overturned. So there was one murder conviction, one nolly prosequi. There was a deal done behind the scenes, obviously. And I think the thinking behind the defence was that if he was done for one murder, his chances of an earlier release would have improved. Because if you're done for two murders, it's probably a little bit longer before you're entitled uh, to, to, uh, to undergo yeah. uh, the whole release process. But uh, that kind of rebounded on them because that in itself created more controversy and the case remained notorious. So instead of uh, being released after 10 years, Malcolm MacArthur actually became one of Ireland's longest serving prisoners and wasn't released yeah. until 30 years after his That's incarceration. Really, it's, really, it's, it's a fascinating story. Grotesque, unbelievable, bizarre and unprecedented. One of the most famous words in Irish um, phraseology. It is the murderer and the Taoiseach also. It's a companion to your brilliant podcast. Oh, thank you, Maria. Goo Boo with the Irish Times, which I loved. Harry McGee, huge congratulations. Thank Great you. Work. Thank Harry. you. Thanks for staying with us now. He certainly keeps us fed here in Ireland, Dan. Absolutely. I am a feeder, aren't I? I'm like Jack, an Irish man. Yeah. Oh, Keith, I'm just so happy to have the barbecue and be outside eating again. What do we have? I am as well. Like, the hair on my hands started to grow back, and now it's gone again. 
Oh, you singed it all oh, yeah. up. I was wondering where that was going. And yeah. it's gone into the lamb. It's gone yeah. into the yeah. lamb. Right. So North here we are, what we're doing. Down. It's what, like, what are they? They're lamb arrayas. They're a Lebanese street food dish that's like exploding in fashion across TikTok, Instagram reels and so on in Israel and Lebanon. You'll see them in every street food fair. Okay. Now all it is is flavoured lamb mints uh, popped into some pitas and then grilled over some hot coals or in a frying pan in your Thank home you kitchen. Are. And I've just served it with some hummus, sriracha and some pickled red onions that I made. Okay, we're... And then to... So let's well, you make in it, what I we're talking. Start working, yeah? Yeah. So in here, I have my lamb mince. <clears throat> and it's just your standard lamb mince. I have garlic, cumin, coriander, chili flakes, parsley, smoked paprika, brown sugar and sesame seeds. Okay. I know it seems like a lot of ingredients. Most of this you should have in your cabinet yeah, at home. Yeah. You should yeah. have parsley in the, in the garden, or I'd recommend to have it in the garden. Yeah. Pop on some gloves, because we're, we're nowhere near a sink, so we might as well keep our hands nice and clean mm -hmm. with the gloves, and just massage it all together. Just get it mixed in. Oh, good, yeah. And you can play around with whatever flavours you want inside this. God, that's very flavoursome. There's a lot of stuff coming through there. It's beautiful, and the freshness of the parsley and the mince as well, I love that. Mm. So then, I have my pita pockets, which were like that, Cut them in half. So do you cut it? Do you, do you cook it like a burger? Cook or it like you, a burger. No. Or you assembled. Huh? Well, you put them into the what? Well, watch. Oh, Almost like a Cornish pasty is actually how I cook them. So I stuff it in like that. All oh, right. So you're putting it in, cooking it in the pita. Yeah. Yeah. That we, this you know? is what we exactly. We were all having this conversation earlier. How do you know it's going to be fully cooked in the middle and stuff? Because I'm, I'm a genius. OK, well, I'll take My genius that sometimes right? generates okay. some Yeah, well, gravity. we take that with a pinch of salt. <laughs> That's <laughs> what my missus says. That's what I said too, sure. Jack, but I think we get found out in the show. <laughs> yeah. Right, fill them up. We'll do a second one just for... just for a view. Just to show it. And just be careful as well when you're so filling them, because they so, can rip. So that's it. That's just it. Just mix it all up, stick in the pit and fire it on the barbecue. You make my job seem very uncomfortable, yeah. you know that? I charge a lot of money for what I do. No, because <laughs> I have to say... No, but now, can I ask you, Jack, oh. if you don't have a meat probe that you had to check the inside of it... Sacrifice one. Just cut it open. Cut it, cut it in half, yeah. So but then, I cut it in half again like that. One, because it looks class when it's cooked, and two, it gives me more surface area to grill, because I'm not going to grill it on the pita, because then the bread will just completely burn. Oh, so, no, you're not going to grill it over the charcoal? No, I'm going to grill so the gonna... meat over the charcoal, just like this. Take the cut side, and put it down. Right. And then the other when cut I side. cook a burger on the barbecue, Jack, I now really flatten them down. Smash them. Yeah, so yeah, to make sure that it's cooked in the middle, because the barbecue gets up to such a high heat. And you know what's nice about it's very smashed hard. down burgers anyway as well? It's easier to get them into your moat. Yeah, but, but this isn't very smashed down. That's what I'm saying. Like, why have you got wait them so to see thick? what it's going to do. But see, oh, the no. first... <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> so this is called, di when it comes to barbecue cooking, I've done this over the last few years in here as well, I refer to a term called direct cooking. Yeah. Because I'm directly cooking over the hot charcoal. Yeah, exactly. That's direct yeah. heat. Once I get them nice and brown, they'll release once they're ready to oh, flip. flip. OK. Get a nice colour on them. So about a minute on each so side, So try and right? brown the, the, the yeah. meat sides, and then you put it over the non-charcoal bit, where the, it's like the indirect heat. Exactly, yeah. So flip them. Like so, you get a nice little colour, flip it over into the other side, give that a minute, and then you move it all the way over here to where there's no charcoal, to my okay. indirect side. So even if you have a gas barbecue and you have, say, three lines on it, yeah. have Ugh. one of them off, so have it on the non. This is going well, Jack, isn't it? Oh, the beauty of live TV, <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, that looks so appetising. I don't do my own <laughs> cooking, you know? <laughs> Put my hand okay, because what people can't see here at the minute is that all the charcoal is on one half of yeah. the barbecue, and then there's no charcoal on the other side of it. So, so yeah, so, so now you just keep it on the indirect side. Exactly. Indirect. And you so, cover it then. And then I cover it with the lid, pop the lid on it, and then it acts just like an oven. And then how long would that go and stay for then? Fifteen minutes, and they were cooked just like that. So fifteen minutes, and then they come out like this. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Make sure, actually, when you put your lid down on top, make sure you keep that top vent open. A lot of people close vents and try and control temperatures. Don't. Your bottom vents at the bottom are open. That allows air to come in, lights the charcoal, and then the top vent allows all the carbon dioxide to get out. Because if you seal that top, you'll starve it of oxygen. And the more oxygen you have, the more heat. It's okay. like barbecuing on a beach. Right, yeah. You know? Now, what's all this for here? So then we're going to make a sauce, right? All right. right. OK. So very quickly, we're just going Thankfully, because make... we have two minutes. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me, right? Into the tahini. So that's a sesame paste, like a sesame peanut butter. We add some chopped garlic. We've got to add some lemon zest. And this is a really traditional 
street food style sauce to go with it. And is this like for you? A little bit of lemon juice then. Tahini, I love tahini. Tahini is one of the this main ingredients it, right? in, uh, in hummus. So then What's some that? honey, nice right. hefty pinch of salt. Mix it all together. If it's too thick, like too peanut thick? buttery, add some hot water. Is that like it that. here? No, that's oh, just that's hummus, hummus, hummus for decoration. Just mix right. it around till you get a nice dipping sauce consistency. Should we be dipping it in there? You should be dipping it in there. Okay. Put so a little dollop on the side of your plate. Okay. Okay. Throw some on there. Lovely. So where is this? So this is Moroccan food, is Lebanese. it? Lebanese. 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 Okay, right. And it's kind of pick like an all sort of like street food that's getting really popular. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a nice little fun thing to do. Something oh, different than burgers and sausages. Mm. And then I just garnished butter. with a little bit of sriracha and I just made at home last night some pickled red onions. So it's one part sugar to two parts vinegar. Bring that up to the boil until the sugar dissolves and then chuck in your onions, leave it overnight. And it's oh, good. I love that tahini. That's gorgeous. Right, the lamb Tastes grab. great. Tastes great. Thank you, Jack, very much. No problem. Now, after the break, Derek is live in Lullymore mm. Heritage Park in County Kildare. We'll see you in a few minutes. Lamb was that delicious. lamb, you just couldn't resist it. <laughs> I haven't seen him move like that since he was actually a professional rugby player. That was That's very impressive. Now, Derek is at Lullymore Heritage and Discovery Park in County Kildare this morning to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the park's opening. Wow. Now, Derek, it looks like it's gorgeous out there this morning. Tell us more. Yeah, Tommy, we're in the thick of it down here in Lullymore County, Kildare this morning. We're at the Heritage and Discovery Park. Uh, Johnny Judge is with us now. Johnny, pump those guns. <laughs> You're about to make it up, yeah. <laughs> You're to Keep working on it. Huh? <laughs> now, tell us about the park. You're up and running 30 years. Yeah, yeah. In uh, 1993, my dad, Sean Judge, opened the park as a social enterprise. And uh, over the course of 30 years, we've, we've de developed the park along. And what you see in front of you today is a credit to the staff that went through the place over the years, you know. Now, you started off very, very small. Yeah, tiny. It was only just a little turf house and a, a tea rooms. And we went from there year on year, developing crazy golf course, playground, all the exhibits, museums, funky forest, cafe, road train. It goes on and on. <laughs> you name it, you've got it. Yeah. Now, let's talk about uh, the beautiful thatched house because a lot of work went into them. Yeah, again, all, all our own staff built them, our own thatchers, roofed, everything, even down to the wood walls. We dug up the lac and mixed it with horse hair and straw and done it in layer by layer and shuttered it and brought it up three years per house to build, but they're authentic mud wall houses. So. And you're talking about walls there, but three foot thick. Yeah, yeah, they're never going to go anywhere, but <laughs> it's a great project to be involved in. So I was 10 when we started that first one, so there's a lot of water under the bridge since then. And we're here in the heart of the Midlands, of course, closely linked with the 1798 Rebellion. Yeah, we've a, we've a museum here dedicated to John Dorley. He was a during the rebellion, he was a huge figure in the area and uh, was involved in many of the huge battles. So we were very proud to tell that story. And from there, then, you've obviously developed the park. And in fact, you've had two presidents down here. Yeah, yeah. We, Mary Robinson opened it in 93. And then we had Mary McAleese and shortly after that as well to open another phase of the park. So, yeah, it's been great. It's so been really exciting. You might get Michael T down. <laughs> oh, a bit of luck. You never know. We got you down, so. <laughs> That's the start over here to Ray Stapleton and Ray very um, we are here in the heart almost the Midlands it's the hidden heartlands in Ireland kind of a foot in boat yeah yeah we're only a few miles from Offaly yeah. the Bog of Allen yeah. we're here in the thick of it aren't we yes yeah you're you're at the gateway to the Bog of Allen really from Dublin um, so it stretches right from West Gildare right into Offaly into East Galway so uh, Huge, huge part of the Midlands story is the peatlands. And let's talk about the bog itself because you've done a lot of work on the a little piece of the bog and you're helping to restore it. Yeah, uh, back where we were one of the early ones to re start rewilding peatlands. So back in 2010, we were in discussions with Bordemona and uh, then eventually we got a lease in 2011 for 46 acres. So it's a very small amount when you consider there's probably half a million industrialised peatlands, uh, acres of industrialised peatlands between Quilt and Bordemona. But in our area, it was like bare peat, so no life really at all. It had been used for peatland extraction, and we just took out the drains, basically very basic rehabilitation, but the transformation's huge. We've so you've done a lot of work rewilding that section yeah. of the bog, rewatering, letting the bog uh, re-wet too? Re-wet. Wildlife started coming back. You just had 
pioneering plants like bog cotton, uh, you have some sphagnum growth and then lots of ling header and things. But over the years, lots of wildlife's come back. We've built a boardwalk going through it. Two kilometres this year, we just finished the latest project. So people can just ramble through and it's a, it's a lovely way just to get and back that's into nature. From made from recycled plastic? All recycled plastic, sourced in Northern Ireland. And um, yeah, we've been working with that company since 2010. But we built it ourselves, as Johnny says. We 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 might get the stuff, but to keep costs down, and that we build the things ourselves. Some of the animals now in the bog. What can we find? Yeah, well, recently we had the pine martin. Um, we filmed it. Uh, Johnny was out with peanut butter on a log. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we were delighted to see delighted to see that things like the pineapple or the pine martin uh, back because uh, that's an you know it's an apex predator, so it means. We're doing something right, the fact that that can live happily here. It's finding food. And, of know. course, bogs are great for storing carbon. Yes, that's that's a big picture with climate change now. The, our, they're the biggest carbon store, land carbon store we have in, in the country. They're storing millions of tonnes of carbon. So by rewetting the bogs, letting nature take it back, you're storing that carbon in, where a bare peat cutway is emitting carbon all the time. All right, onwards and upwards from there. Now, we're speaking to, uh, before we let you go, uh, we've got David. Uh, David, pop out here. Uh, he's the master farrier. He's a busy man here this morning. Uh, David, how long are you, how long are you uh, uh, shoeing horses? Shoeing horses now around 15 years. Okay, great. Started in 07, 08 kind of thing and then took over from there. Served my time um, in Newbridge County, Kildare. So you're a busy man here busy in the heart man. of Horseland. Uh, if you're going to shoe a horse here this morning, what are we going to do? So basically what we're doing is our foot prepared, shoes heated up and into shape. So what we're going to do is burn the shoe onto our hoof and that makes the perfect ideal fit. Uh, big stretch. And you've already there. cooled that down as well, Dave? No, it's hot now at the minute. So what we're doing is now we're going to make a little bit of smoke. Okay, here we go, live on air, shoeing a horse. <laughs> we love that. He doesn't feel that at all, Dave, does None he? None whatsoever, no. No pain. No pain, no gain. So what it does, we just hold it on for a couple of seconds, get the shoe to fit into our hoof as we have it there now. How many, how many of these do you do a day, Dave? Ah, around six or seven. About six or seven, six yes. Or seven. You're a busy man. Do you ever get a kick from a horse, the by the way? Time. The odd time. Yeah. <laughs> the odd time. No, it's, not a, it's not ideal to be getting a kick of a horse. It's, 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 it's part of the job. Before we let you go, where, where can we find you online? www.lullymoreheritagediscoverypark.com All right, so there we have it, guys. We'll keep shooting the horses, but for now, from everyone here at the park, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Derek. That's how Don't I feel every now, morning trying to get ready. Steam <laughs> coming off my feet, my ears. There's what? actually this that much steam coming outfit. out of our dressing room as well. We don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> we never ask. We just go, keep going, keep <laughs> going. Stay away. Anyway, coming up next, in the next hour, we're going to be talking to Philly McMahon and Rory O'Connor as they talk joining forces for a good cause. Plus, we meet the DJ that's worked with everyone from Tom Grennan to David Guetta. Joel Corey joins us very shortly. He's got some bangers. Is what He's you got, got some bangers. bangers. And we'll also have the Skin Nerd, a.k.a. Jennifer Rock, here to answer your questions. You can get them into us on 0896 111 We'll talk to you shortly. It's a lovely day, though. It's not chilly. <laughs> not chilly at all, Marin, chilly. is it? It's not um, chilly at all. You were sitting here freezing as well. No, no, thank you. We're in the shade. Uh, we're in the shade, that's right. It's a lovely day. We were talking to Hildegard Nocton, Minister, obviously, about this new law that uh, Stephen Donnelly is trying to sign or is signing Signed in. in that is requiring cancer warnings to be on alcoholic beverages. And it's got a lot of people messaging. A lot of people mentioning kind of in, yeah. And no, we were you even mentioned, Tommy, is it not better to maybe to do a campaign? on television or radio, massive campaign. And John says, most people have access to social media. Surely a targeted campaign online would achieve more than sticking a label on a bottle. How many people have you ever seen looking at labels when reading about alcohol? And it's true, so there'd be something else on the back of the bottle. All you could look at is the... The, the, all I look at it is the volume. I mean, we're just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we're, I mean, we're championing, like, Ireland are the first to do this. But I kind of wonder, like, alcohol obviously is a huge issue and there are cancer warnings yes. out there. But there's, like, where does it end? Like, I think about the Smarties my kids pick up, like, with the sugar and obesity and oh, Coca -Cola diabetes. Coca-Cola or any of those, those soft drinks. But I don't think we are championing. I think it seems like it's a PR exercise. 
Well, and you're kind of like, we're the first. And we're like, why don't we do it with Europe? So is that we've got collective bargaining to actually make a difference. It feels weird to do a solo run well, on exactly, this. that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, Stephen Donnelly well, is trying look, to say that we were, the, we were the first to bring in the smoking ban. People sort of said, oh, it'll never smoking work. Smoking ban, but we did the labels together, worldwide. It was, yeah. an, it was a group effort. And I get it, the, the plastic bag tax, all that kind of stuff. I do understand that. But this <clears> needs collective bargaining. And also, but I wonder, like, if, you, if I go into a fast food restaurant and I see the calories beside it, does it make a difference to me? Probably not, because I've made that decision. But it might make a difference if I looked at it in the wine label. Um, yeah, listen, and thank you would for saying it. make a difference? Would you not buy the bottle of wine if you saw that what it could do to you? <laughs> I'd buy the bottle of wine. Oh, except um, I think well, so. Well, Andrew, Andrew said, I agree with the alcohol labels, but I think the same thing should be done with processed foods, which we're seeing as a massive issue. And we should also put labels and the likes of Coke on red and processed meats. But look at Andrew. Are you that going to everything. put the bottle of wine back on the shelf after you read it? Surely you know the dangers of you buying a bottle of wine. If you saw or how many calories are in it, though, if for people who are calorie counting yeah. and that sort of thing, which a lot of people do with their foods, like if you saw actually yeah. how many calories are in a can of beer and you think, oh, I'm not going to buy six of them. Do you know what I mean? Because you know how many calories are in your glass of wine. I try not to. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, so now go. they're going, you can't. So anyway, listen, it just feels like it should be a European approach, I'm though, to make sure that it's properly thought out, because sometimes we and don't do wonder, that very could well. Could money be spent better other places? Yeah. Anyway, coming up next, we're going to be anyway. chatting to formal Dublin all-star Philly McMahon and comedian Rory Stories. They're going to be coming in for a quick chat. Absolutely. But before that, here is a sneak peek of, uh, peek of tonight's crime drama, The Hunt for Raul Moshi. You can catch it on Virgin Media 1 at 9pm and, of course, on the Virgin media player. Let's take a look. It's my ex, Raul. You'll not have it, you and me. The gunman's been named as Raul Moat. Shoots his ex, shoots a new fella in cold blood. I'm resting till we get him. A brand new three-part drama, The Hunt for Raul Moat. Monday to Wednesday at 9 on Virgin Media 1. Welcome back. Now, one's a former Dublin All-Star and the other is a comedy content creator from Meath. Very unlikely pairing, but it does seem to work. Billy McMahon and Rory O'Connor, a.k.a. Rory Stories, are defying county rivalries and joining us this morning. I feel they're, like, trying to set you up. Again, Meath versus Dublin. It's, you're in the same category, Rory, aren't you, when it comes to playing GAA well, I think as, he's got it Philly. wrong. He's actually from Dublin. Ashbourne's in Dublin. Oh, go oh yeah. here we go. <laughs> well, Did listen, you... when I was growing up, uh, Mead were used to beating Dublin, and that's why I have to dream of it'll come back. But it's, it is it is difficult living in Ashbourne, where there is a lot of dubs, where I'm from. And, uh, what about the women, though? Well, they are the saviours. Like, and when they, when they won the All Ireland uh, and they bet Dublin, which was very unlikely, I definitely had my Mead flag uh, very high that day in my housing estate. Uh, so, and they're giving, bringing pride back. So. Uh, <laughs> Don't want to talk about uh, about men's football, if that's all right. We'll well, move on. <laughs> you, you did play for me, is that right, at one stage? Yeah, I would have played against Philly at underage. Uh, I was playing midfield and Philly would have been cornerback and he would have come out marking me one of the days, but it didn't go too well for Philly, I don't think. But, no, uh, it was probably up your knee at that, yeah, that, that time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> he was six for four at, that, at, at yeah. that age. So, yeah, played as well. So that's the kind of... We, we know each other very well. You've been to each other's weddings and stuff. Like, are you... You're properly mates. Yeah, yeah, although we're from different counties yeah, um, that dislike each other, yeah, we are proper mates. Rory could have actually played for the Dubs at one point. He nearly joined Ballymun Kickhams at the age of 15 and 16. There's two lads played for, for Ballymun Kickhams who actually moved to Ashbourne, but committed back to train for Ballymun Kickhams. And Rory nearly signed for Ballymun Kickhams. Did you play a game or something that year? Yeah, I spoke to a few wise yeah. people in Ashburn and said, no, you're staying poor. And they were right. But uh, no, we, we, uh, we, we knew each other since then. And then we ended up in Clash to Eda for about three months together uh, I, as I well. I love this. But the thing is, is that really would have played for Dubs. Like, anybody could get a Meads jersey. But yeah. I mean, for the Dubs, could be a different kind of thing. Tommy, many of our of Monaghan got you relaxed down there, will you? Back in your box. Oh, my <laughs> God. Listen, uh, you both came together for a very worthwhile project, of course, Gaelic in the Joy. How did it come about, Philly? Well, Rory and Jamie, the, the uh, executive producer of Motive Television, came to me, actually, because they knew I was doing work in Mount Joy uh, for, for, for a few years, and they pitched the idea of doing the Me Machines type concept uh, 
but a real life version of it. And, and I was like, is that bonkers? This is Me that Machine, that's the film, isn't it? With a Me and Machine, or The Jill. Longest Yard is another version yeah. of it. Yeah. Prisoners yeah. Against the Prison Guards yes. type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Escape to Victory. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, me being in the, the kind of environment, I was kind of very pessimistic around the idea. And this is Mr. Optimistic here. Even to this morning, getting over in the traffic, he's like, give me grand. I'm like, I'll be 20 minutes late, Rory. <laughs> but he's, he's he, you know, he's very optimistic. He, he said, look, let's ask the question. We went to Governor Mullins. It was a, a key part for it, you know, happening. And uh, we pulled a lot of people together and, and we all started to go in the one direction and it happened. So this is a programme where you're going in and you're playing Gaelic games with prisoners. And we know that we've got uh, prisoners from Mountjoy who watch this, who watch the programme and good morning to them. So when you're going inside there, Rory, I suppose uh, you're, you're giving wider society a view into Mountjoy. Because sometimes I think what people forget is that inside in prison, these are people. That are there, and as Philly said, you work inside in Mountjoy an awful lot of the time, and it's something that we have to start thinking about recidivism, like looking for the good and, and trying to rehabilitate people. Yeah. yeah, and and that was like my, my my belief and vision just from my own story and and friends of mine that would have ended up down the wrong road. For me, it was just I want to prove that it's my gut feeling right that not everyone in there is a bad egg, and and there, there's a reason behind everyone being there. Like everyone has a story to tell, and people I'm sure can identify a part of their life where they made the, the wrong decision and went that way. Because, like, I don't believe anyone's uh, born bad. I think it's, you know, the product of our environment or whatever it may be that leads you there. And and that's that's what I wanted to prove. And I remember saying to Philly when we left Mount Joy uh, after the three or four months film, and I said, Philly, like, what we experienced in there for three or four months, you wouldn't get that in Trinity College for four years in a degree. Like, it was real life experience, like, and, I'm just so happy that the positive reception episode one got last Wednesday. Like it was amazing amount of positivity. Like mm. I was genuinely blown away. Like not even social media, just on my own town people coming up. You know, people I thought that would maybe have a stigma about this. And I was like, you think this is good? I thought you might have been a bit snobbery towards this, but now everyone's seen why we wanted to do this project. And uh, yeah, it, it, I'm definitely proud of it, like, you know, and, and you know, Philly was the perfect uh, person to come in and do it because of, obviously, his football experience and, and, and what he was doing in Mount Joy. So, it was a great journey, it really was, and, and I'm looking forward for people to see how it unfolds. Like, yeah. I, and because, like, you talk about everybody has that crossroads, and it's really, I really enjoyed bit you talking to your dad about that. You can go one way and go the other, and everybody is in that. And, you, like, the work that you do, Philly, in there, mm. like, do you see that with people? Like, did something like this give them a purpose almost to get behind and actually think that this is maybe the way forward if I, when I do get out of here? Well, the crucial thing for us was to, you know, to get real, get real with the expectations we had for, for what was going to happen over a short period of time of 12 weeks. You know, we weren't going to completely change mm. these lads' lives in 12 weeks because the amount of time it took them to get to where they are now, um, it's going to take a lot more time and energy to, to actually veer the, the pathway that they, were, they, they are currently on. But for us, it's like, look, there's 12 weeks. We want, you to show, we want to show you when you do good things and you surround yourself with good people, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you know, you play sport or you join fitness, whatever it is, that yeah. you can take that and, you know, when you reintegrate into society after you've done your sentence, take that model and philosophy and go with it and see what happens. And it's amazing that you've decided to do this because I know you've got a friend who's inside there and obviously your brother, uh, John, um, would have been in Mount Joy. So to actually use real world experience and let us see that. It's Gaelic in the Joy and you can see it on Orty. Before we let you go, we have to get down to the business, Philly. <laughs> this year, the championship. Well, it's gone. all over the papers at the minute. The kingdom are coming back, he's saying. <laughs> I was hoping... You, you should, were everywhere. Yeah. We saw you everywhere in the papers this morning. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, so I've been asked a couple of questions around who... But the obvious one is, will the dubs do it? And I'd love to just give the answer yes, but that's not going to be the correct answer, you know. Um, You're a pundit now. You've got yeah, to draw so it out. You've got to draw yeah. it out. Get off the fence, Not man. lucky. You can't say anybody's going to win it at the minute. It's so called we'll a see. rogue and Kerry, is what it is. So, like, don't mind him. Get him outside away from the camera. He'll tell you. Kerry are definitely going to win it. Yeah, definitely going to win it. And Mayo are going to win it. And the Dubs are just, you know, they're not going to win it this year. That's <laughs> OK, well, there we are. So, <laughs> we, you know the thing, powerful thing about that? We'll just clip that little <laughs> yeah. bit up there. Exactly. And the yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he's extending that punditry career right now. 
<laughs> um, listen, uh, Phil e. McMahon and Rory O'Connor, listen, thank you so much for coming in and talking. So looking forward to episode two uh, tomorrow night. It's Thanks a great so show. Much, Good guys. on you. It's a so pleasure talking to you. Still to come, reality TV star turned DJ Joel Carey and the skin nerd sub up, uh, serves up some dewy skin for summer. We'll see you after this very short break. Welcome back. Our next guest has provided the soundtrack to Many a Night Out. Oh. He's taking the party to Cork next month. Are you all Many right there? a Night Out. <laughs> Someone just back from his holidays. I think he was I dancing. actually, have, I've definitely heard some of these tunes. DJ Joel Corey joins us now. Stop but before it. we meet him, let's take a quick listen to some of his most memorable hits. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, we're rocking, we're rocking away here. Good morning to you, Joel. How are you? <laughs> Good morning, guys. Thanks for having Just me. Just what on. you want, Joel. Two old ones bopping around yeah. like it's 1995 right. to your songs. Joel, I have to say, I was at Pride in the Canaries and you are on the set list every night. You literally <laughs> oh, were. <laughs> they, they were banging out your tunes every night there. Listen, this all started for you with um, initially inspired by your brother. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, my brother was a DJ um, and, you know, I was um, just wanted to get a pair of decks when I was, like, younger just because I wanted to be cool like my older brother. Um, and I got them one year for Christmas and it became my hobby, my passion. And, you know, I've never looked back ever since. It's always been, been my dream to tour the world and have hit records. And, li listen, I'm, I'm living my dream right now and I'm so happy. And the 16-year-old DJ was DJ Jenga? <laughs> oh, God. I can't believe you found that out. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was one of my dodgy names back in the day. <laughs> it's, it's like when we go back and we all think back to our first email address, and you're like, oh my God, need to change that. Yeah. Need to change that. It's been because you know the DJ has always played such an important role. You know, for we can go back ages, but like Fat Boy Slim, and then of course you've got David Guetta, the likes of Calvin Harris, and it's always so important to find your uh, vocal partner. So how does that work, going out there and being like, she's going to be perfect for this song? Do you have your sights set on people? Um, to be honest, for me, it's all about the, the song is the most important thing. So, you know, I do a lot of studio sessions with songwriters and artists. And, you know, I'm not particularly going after a certain name. It's just whatever I, I'm drawn to. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky now to work with some amazing talent. And, yeah, it's um, over the last few years, you know, the amount of people I've worked with, I, I can't believe it when I think about it. Um, but yeah, for me, it's all about the song is the most important thing. And when you get in the studio and that magic happens, yeah, it's just the best feeling. And did they come looking for you as well? I mean, when you when you think of Tom Grennan and Lionheart, I mean, that that tune, like, is so, so, look, you're looking at me like, <laughs> do you know this? I do know these songs. Yes. But I mean, do the people come looking for you, like, because you've had this now reputation of working so well with people, do they come and say, Joe, let's work together on a track? Um, I definitely feel like as the journey's gone on and I've had more success in my music, it is like those conversations are a bit easier. And yes, people do come to me more often, but also, you know, I'm very proactive. So I'm always hitting people up in the DMs and being like, let's get in the studio. And you mentioned Tom Grennan, for example. I met him at a festival last summer and I was like, I'm a big fan of yours. Let's get in the studio. We got to do a tune together. And, you know, he was really up for it. And, you know, Tom's become such a great friend of mine. And I love Lionheart, man. It's, that was a great experience working with Tom. And you, of course, you know, we've spoken to people here like Lyra and Amy, whose songs appear on Love Island. And they don't know, they're kind of like getting a phone call going, you might be on Love Island. And they're sitting down and it's them and they get so excited. That's like, that's what happened to you in 2019. One of your songs was on Love Island. And then in 2022, you went into the villa. So what was that <laughs> like? Like you were playing a set there to all and going like, oh, hopefully someone's going to hook up to my song. Yeah, it was good. It was good fun. You know, um, I remember I was out on tour in the summer and I got a phone call and it was like, Joel, they're throwing a pool party. They need a DJ. They'd love you to get down there and drop some bangers. And I was like, say no more. 
booked my plane ticket and I got there and, um, you know, it was good fun. Got to meet all the cast and the production crew. And then, you know, we did the reunion show as well. Um, yeah, everyone loves Lo Love Island and it? it's great fun. So I was happy to be involved in it. I love the way you're so modest about these things and you're sort of saying that you're fan, you're just fans of people, you'll hit them up on, on the DMs and stuff like that, because you did have a, a fangirl moment with Becky Hill. Tell us about that. <laughs> Oh, well, listen, Becky Hill is the queen of dance music. That's somebody that I have been a big fan of for so many years. I've been playing her records. You know, she's been going for so... You, you don't realise how many hits that she's had until you see her perform live. It's amazing. And I got the chance to work with her um, last year of our record history. And again, she's someone that's become a really, really good friend of mine. I love her. Um, and I'm just so glad to see her doing so well and getting the recognition worldwide that she deserves. And you've been doing this for quite a long time. You had your own, you know, experience with reality TV appearing on Geordie Shore. And this was when, you know, things like Instagram and Twitter, they were really in their infancy, but people were really discovering how to use them, not always for good. So how was that for you, kind of? It, it was definitely a step up in your career, but was it a bit of a, oh God, this is a lot. Um, looking back on those years, you know, I've got really great memories and I'm grateful that I had that experience. Um, yeah, you mentioned the social media thing. Like back then, there was really no filter whatsoever. Um, but I guess on that side of things, it helped me kind of get a bit of a thick skin for the, you know, for that type of thing, which is I think benefited me later in life and the career I've got now. Um, but yeah, looking back on those years, it was just great fun. I was a young lad, um, got to travel the world um, and be part of that experience. And um, yeah, we had we had some fun times. <laughs> you did. He was the oh. one fella with the south of like you know with the kind of Cockney accent with all the and and deck in Newcastle people. I, like, they were like, all right, Joel. It was one of my guilty pleasures. I just oh, loved it. Everybody just loved it. It was such fun. But listen, you're saying that you're, you do so much work in the studio, but I suppose as a DJ, you just want to be behind those decks in front of a crowd, and you are going to be in Cork very soon at the Voodoo Rooms in Cork on June 1st. So what can people expect? Well, listen, Ireland feels like a second home to me. Um, you know, I love coming to Ireland. I always say that around the world, wherever I DJ, whether it be in Vegas or Ibiza, anywhere, you always know the Irish in the crowd because they're Come the ones on, who are Ibiza! Really for it. The, court, the, the voodoo rooms in Cork's going to feed a pizza. Really? Come on. He's yeah. saying you always know you're Irish in the crowd because we always bring a blum and tricolor with us wherever we go. <laughs> We're here! the Irish in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to get on I'm to really Lyra. What's that, sorry? You'll have to get on to Lyra to do something with you, one of the queens of Cork. Well, let's do it. I'm up for it, man. And, and you know, I can't remember. The last time I came to Cork, I had the best time. It's a lovely place. It's been a while since I've been back, so I'm really looking forward to the night. I heard it's sold out, so I know it's going to be an absolute banger. I hope you guys are going to be there too. That, well, do you know what? He's been going on about you so much. If I don't see him down there <laughs> shaking his tricolour around, I'll give out to him, Joel. I'll make sure he hits you up in the DMs. Joel Carey is going to be performing in the Voodoo Rooms in Cork on the 1st of June. It's been a pleasure talking to Joel. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining thanks so us. so much. Go on. Lovely. Love is bangers. Now, coming up next, the skin nerd shares her secrets to dewy, sun-kissed skin like you would have in Ibiza. We'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us and the beautiful outside and the freezing cold. <laughs> our resident skincare expert, Jennifer Rock, is here to talk about how to uh, nurture our inner and our outer glow. Listen, yeah. we're in the shade. It is actually sunny in places. I know, it is lovely places, day. So it's a lovely little... day. Jennifer, it is lovely to have you here. Uh, we have, and you have received so many questions. Yes. You've matched products up to some of the questions. So we're going to kick straight off with Kate. Mm -hmm. And Kate has asked, what's a good all-rounder for health and beauty that works as you always say, from the inside out. He said, inside out, baby, 365. I'm always a fan of Revive Active, there's no denying it. I'm a big believer in consistency. I think it's about what you take, how regularly you take it, and making sure that you comply. So I take this every single day. It's a sachet, it's so easy. You put it into, Alan has one I yeah. prepared earlier. You can put it into your cup, into your glass. I keep it beside my desk, so at home I kind of have no excuse but not to get it you in. You just take one a day. One sachet a day, in you go, shake, shake, shake. Drink it, have a little sip there. Now, just see, I took these all over over winter when I was doing panto because I thought I'd get run energy. down mm -hmm. and you just uh, and then I stopped but because oh, I just really because show. I think people have it in their mind to take a supplement 
when you're when you might be working very hard or run down or feel. Are you're you saying you're down. not working hard right now? No, <laughs> I work very hard all year round. But, no, do you, but would you take it all the time? To build up immunity, 100%. I totally understand the rationale of taking it at times. And look, summer is busy. We're going to weddings and holidays, and you're, you know you're on the go so much more. But I take this 365. This is the original formula, but with their zesty twist. So it's the exact same. I like to call it not a multivitamin, but a super vitamin because it literally has 26 active nutrients inside. So it's not that it's in lieu of a healthy diet. It's in addition to a healthy okay. diet. And it just the taste is nice. It encourages me to want no, to take lovely. it. It's I not mean, just water. And that's it. And you get, you get your little cup yeah. as well. Yeah, it? you get your cup. Or you can put it into a normal glass because I always lose the cups. But brilliant. Inside out. Uh, Lorda has said my hair at this time of year is so limp. Everyone yes. talks about beach hair during the summer and I just don't know what to do to mine Ooh. without damaging it. What can I use? Can we just say that before, when I came on for my teas, my hair was limp and lank, so I totally understand this question. And afterwards, although a little bit windswept, thanks to Andrew Fitzsimons, I have a textural spray. So this particular spray is called the Apre Sexe, so I hope you think I look Apre, Apre Sexe. Sexe. Yeah, Are yeah. you having a laugh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a textural spray. Apre <laughs> Sexe. Into your heart there, Alan. But essentially, it really... So what claim, do you do? Can so you, yeah, okay. Come on, okay, do it. So you just basically... You essentially, oh, well, all over my hand, perfect. All right. No, we're joking. Put it straight into the hair, right into the and root, then you... and you just separate it out. So instead of having like a really sleek, polished finish, your hair would actually adore it because you like to have your hair down around by your face, and it just gives a little bit of va va voom, a little bit of grit, if I may, but without being. So you kind but of, it's not hairspray. You bring it, kind of ruffle it more in oh, the hair, nice. and, it, it and the nice. smell is actually particular nice. technology that has like a citrus scent to it, so it allows your hair. So if you wanted to, you know, snuff it, you're turning me on. You're so <laughs> <laughs> but it really, it God, really if I'm turning you on, I'm oh, doing something wrong. Something like, wrong. It allows you to get a couple of days out of your hair as well, so it just gives a little bit of volume. I find it very hard to oh. keep a curl on my hair, so it just kind of widens and volumizes the hair. So, okay, yeah. so texture spray does okay, actually work. So. Okay, and an okay. Irish uh, Andrew Fitzgerald. Yeah, Andrew Fitzgerald, Irish. Irish. a phenomenal Michelle, stylist. Okay, Michelle says, I'm on a low budget as a mature student with a mortgage, mm -hmm. but still want active ingredients. What would you suggest I do? So the ordinary has stood the test of time. It revolutionised the skincare sector. It's made it so affordable, so accessible. It's all about key ingredients. This is their newest, not even on Irish shelves, can I say. Oh. It's out this oh. Friday. So it's on their own website, but it's coming to Brown Thomas this Friday. So this is the natural moisturising factor and beta glucan. Now, you've heard about hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid we naturally have inside us. It's become a cult ingredient yes. in skincare. Yes. Beta glucan is the next generation to that. It actually hydrates the skin 20 times more oh. than hyaluronic. Oh my God. But look, it's €6.90, guys. It's an extreme Six decent. euro ninety. Yeah, so yeah the ordinary is very, very light. Who I think will love this is someone who really wants hydration but is conscious of breakouts and doesn't like to put a moisturizer on. But you really do still need to hydrate that skin. Yeah. So it's a beta glucan essentially is a really large particle, extremely hydrating. The dash is, are behind these the it, buzzwords we're going to be hearing now words. all the time? I, look, I honestly beta glucan, for example, is an ingredient I've spoken about for years. I'm just delighted that a brand like this is bringing it into the mainstream so people become accustomed to it. There's okay. ceramides in it as well, so extremely lightweight, beautiful gel, really instantly absorbs into the skin. A stunning summer product, I have to say. Okay. Lovely. Okay, right. that's launching on Friday and it'll be in Brent Thomas. Uh, Sam says, I really invest in my skincare, yet wear makeup every day sometimes yes. and please don't give out to me, I sleep in it. What's okay. the best type of makeup to wear? So this uh -oh. brand, Etal, is a new brand. It's relatively new to the Irish and the UK market. So I am wearing it this. right now and I generally feel that I love it for so many reasons. So Etal essentially means and more in it. This brand has a conscience. So it's first and foremost, it's makeup, but it also has skincare ingredients in it, but they're active ingredients. So sometimes with makeup, you'll have a little sprinkle of ingredients, but this actually has the correct level as would a skincare product. So not only are you getting skincare, but you're getting makeup too. It's it's vegan, it's cruelty free, it's sustainable. The packaging oh. in a lot of their products are biodegradable, they're refillable, is there an SPF recyclable. On it? This has an SPF of twenty in it as well. Twenty. When we're like for, for example, today That's I have really nice. It's, it's thicker than stunning. I thought, but it's lovely. You need this small and I really mean it, you mean the smallest amount. I've quite a little bit more on than my norm today for television, but out and about during the day, if you're trying to get a makeup that is really kind to the skin, doesn't budge, water resistant, looks That's like skin good. and extremely hydrating and anti-inflammatory, then this is the one. 32 shades, and they call it a 3D matte finish, so it just looks like skin, like dewy, but not too wet, but not too matte either. Really do, like, thumbs up, 10 out of 10. Brilliant. Okay, Melanie's been on to us and she says, um, I, the pharmacist told me I have a condition called, uh, is it melasma? Yes. Now, I wonder what can I do, what sunscreen will provide me, for, well, like, can I use, 
without it getting worse. So we know SVF is a 365 scenario, particularly when you have pigmentation. Now, pigment, so melasma, for anyone that doesn't know, is a form of pigment. It manifests almost like a butterfly effect across the face. It's, it's, it can be really debilitating because yeah. people can say, you've got something on your face there, and it can look like freckles right up to looking mottled and almost dirty in appearance, like a tea bag stain on the face. So it affects people. So for this situation, SPF to prevent against future damage is key. That pigment, unfortunately, will keep coming through unless you really repair it with treatments. However, SPF, what, one, what I consider, has to be a 50. And it has to be one that you like. So the choice that I have here is Neostrata. It's a dermatologist-based brand. It's a physical SPF. It's your SPF 50. It's 39.95, extremely affordable. Um, and it's mattifying. It's a beautiful light tint. It has antioxidants in it. And, and it's extremely have, hydrating. We also have yours, your skin Yeah, another, skin another example. So it's really right. lightweight. And your, your one is, is Factor 50 also, Factor is it? 50. And really the SPF that you love. So this one is a primer. It's got a peachy tint to it. It looks like a, a kind of a, a natural layer to the skin. It's won lots of awards, but ultimately it has won lots of, has won lots of awards. Board and the and Tommy, winning and award, Tommy big award fan, winning. big fan. <laughs> but I mean, the thing great. is, and we know this for a fact that we're going to have a lot of sunshine this week. Yes. And people in yes. Ireland think when we're away, we will slap on the, right. the, the sun it's factor, lovely. but not necessarily no, here. Please get it on yourself, guys, and how much you apply two finger lengths and just enjoy it. Joyous. The Rock the Skin Nerds, thank you so much with her own thank progress. And uh, we'd also like to take a very quick moment to say a huge thank you to our producer, Luke Mulcahy. He is leaving us uh, to go to a different program. It's on at night. Where are you they going, Luke? We're going to miss you, Luke. Uh, Come on, we love you, Luke. On this tomorrow's show, we're going to talk to the stunning strikes of World Cup dreams with Republic of Ireland captain and Arsenal star Katie McCabe. Best-selling crime novelist Joe Spain chats page turners and her for foray into politics, plus writing for television. And from uh, juggling to plate spinning, we're going to try our hand at circus performing. We are. It we wouldn't are right be girl. Wednesday without an old circus <laughs> on Ireland AM. See you we'll tomorrow. see you tomorrow. Bye. Is this the S Join the Song? Is that